Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. For anyone who's been paying attention to emotions in the Reformed evangelical theological world in the last decade, you'll know that there have been enormous controversies related to the doctrine of God, particularly about whether or not we can say that the Son eternally submits to the Father, whether we should accept and or how we should understand divine simplicity, and finally, what a proper conception of the Trinity might be. Of an especially sensitive nature over the last five or so years have been accusations made against very prominent theologians such as K. Scott Oliphant and John Frame and Kevin Van Hooser that their doctrine of God falls short of the Catholic synthesis on these matters and that their peculiar formulations fall afoul of the classical and reformed doctrine of God. With me today is my good friend Ryan Hurd. Like many of my favorite thinkers and people, Ryan is an independent scholar. His formal training is in Reformed Orthodox and Medieval Historical Theology, but his primary intellectual focus is in the project of systematic theology and particularly on the doctrines of the Trinity and divine simplicity. He does a good bit of translation work and is currently working on several writing projects, which will see the light of day, Lord willing, in good time. (laughs) Ryan, I'm very grateful to have you with us, um, and I guess we can just get straight to it. Why don't you... um, I guess, first of all, can you tell us what you think the main points of contention or or two, maybe main two points of contention are, uh, and what is at stake in this, in these these modern and contemporary debates we're having in these, in our reformed circles? Yeah, thanks, uh, Joseph. It's really great to be here. It's a privilege. It's a great question uh, and a difficult one to really answer. We're living in a time period where doctrine of God has a large number of variant streams that have all accumulated and they're running together and there's a lot of whirlpools and overlaps. Uh, I suppose uh, you could come at it from various angles uh, that would shed light on the matter if you approached it perhaps from the issue of methodology. Uh, You might think of the differences that are appearing as primarily those that are ones of variant theological method that Uh, have the immediate effect of somewhat shaping the conceptual content that's being uh, brought forward. And so if you went that route, which I think is somewhat helpful, at least is a beginning to understand what's going on, the difference on a surface level is something like a style of doing theology. It's, uh, as I see it, often uh, parsed out between pairs. So you have biblicists on the one side who are concerned with the express language of scripture, You have on the other side of them, uh, scholastics who are willing to speculate and systematize. Uh, You you could consider in terms of new school, on the one hand, willing to uh, articulate in terms of new developments in philosophy, uh, especially those of analytic philosophy or analytic theology. And then maybe on the other hand of that, you have the old school guys who are determined to have the bonds of orthodoxy parsed primarily in terms of the creeds and of classical languages that have been developed throughout the centuries, especially of an Aristotelian hue. Uh, You could also have uh, the situation parsed in terms of Antillians on the one side and Thomas on the other between process theists on the one hand and Aristotelians, and again, especially those of a Thomas variety on the other. All these are accurate handles, uh, I think, for each side, broadly speaking, but it's critical to note that various figures find themselves located on those coordinates in different ways and often straddling different of those conceptual analyses. But really, I think that the method is at least illuminating Uh, to examine, at least priorly, uh, in order to understand part of what's going on. Uh, In my opinion, though, that it's not just the entirety of the disagreement. I I think that's not even really the nub of the disagreement. It's uh, about method broadly, but it is primarily, uh, despite all appearances, a difference over conceptual content, a, a disagreement over facts, a disagreement over beliefs, And then secondarily, how you parse those beliefs. I think method is often uh, easier to see. It's very easy to pick up uh, an an analytic theologian and see a a wide variety of doing theology, at least in comparison to more traditional methods. But 
underlying those differences of method, I do think are conceptual differences. Uh, uh, there's the question, of course, of whether methodological strictures are necessarily determinative of, of content in, in somewhat of a backfeed sort of way. And, and I think that it often does. Uh, so, for instance, you have analytic philosophers or theologians who, in my opinion, at least, impose certain strictures on the fundamental questions about God that are uh, really part and parcel to their methodological approach. And this constrains them, again, at least in my opinion, to not being able to properly perform theology. We see these issues crop up over many things, especially uh, in what's now been so-called the metaphysical attributes of God, things like simplicity, infinity, immutability, and, and, and so on. But again, when, when you start looking at these things, it's, it's primarily just a fundamental, fundamentally different view of reality. The differences are philosophically motivated, especially and uh, yeah, they're, they're primarily those of conceptual content. Mm. Um, uh, kind of parsing it down in terms of, uh, if, if we could put it this way, sort of the, the, the lightning rod issues that we've been debating about. Uh, could you, for, for those who are sort of uninitiated in these disputes, could you say a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, so for instance, one of the big ones has been the eternal subordination of the sun. What are people arguing about there? What's the, what's the idea? What are the, what are the two sides, if you will? I mean, maybe there's more than two sides, but broadly speaking, could you say what those two sides are? Yeah, well, the ESS debates uh, kind of hit their heyday, I suppose, a few years ago, primarily on the blogosphere. Um, and you did, you're, you're right to say there were probably two sides that emerged. Um, on the one hand, you had primarily those who were more biblicist. And again, I don't mean that term pejoratively, but they were, they were concerned with the, the express language of scripture, which presents to us uh, uh, the son under the terms of, of the Christ, who uh, is continually referred to as being obedient and submissive to the father. The question of whether that ought to be read back onto the eternal relationship that has always existed and is not necessarily uh, tied directly to the, uh, the incarnation itself was something that those who would affirm the eternal subordination of the Son are, are advocating for. So the obedience that we see in the human uh, man Christ, uh, his uh, obedience according to his humanity, is in some sense illustrative, in some sense indicative of the eternal relationship in such a way that there is an actual submission and inferiority. Uh, and again, inferiority is a very pejorative term. It's a very naughty term in terms of uh, classical Trinitarian theology. I don't think that really uh, there's a lot of pejorative overtones that need to be retained, especially in the contemporary uh, context. You, you read these ESS guys, those who are affirming it, and they're, they're of course very squishy on the issues, and I certainly disagree. But by inferiority, they're trying to put words to that basic move, which looks at the obedience of the son according to his humanity and tries to allow that to inform uh, the, 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 the eternal state, as it were, of the, of the father and son thing. They're trying to do justice to just that, the, the terms father and son, and trying to articulate that in terms that aren't so friendly, again, to uh, Orthodox Trinitarianism, but the intentions, I think, largely are, are are purer than at least some people have, have uh, suggested. And, and of course, on the other side of that, you have a number of folks who resisted this very strongly, uh, rightly motivated by concern of language in as much as language uh, informs us of what we think and, and also to some extent controls what we think and how, how we, uh, we uh, approach pro uh, theological problems. They realize that you can't parse the eternal state, and again, we, we, you know, the, these, these terms are not really very helpful or, or precise, but you can't parse the father-son situation, as it were, eternally, in terms of inferiority. This is uh, Arianism, they would claim, and these sorts of things, and uh, yes, it, it, it became, became quite, a, uh, quite a consternation. What's rather interesting, and I've pointed this out to a number of guys who are uh, whom, whom I would largely agree with against the ESS, for sure. Uh, let there be no mistake. Uh, 
the interesting thing is that you find in the tradition uh, a willingness to talk about authority that the father has over the son and these sorts of things, which are primarily the motivations that are bringing the pro ESS guys to say what they're saying, even if they're not saying it very clearly. And it'd be wrong to give an indication, as I think that some have who are against the ESS, that this language is meaningless and the portraiture of scripture is to be emptied of all positive conceptual content, which I'm afraid at times impression is being given that that's the move of classical theism, which it certainly is not. Right, right. Um, uh, what What's going on, do you think, in the... Well, I think you've already answered this. My second question was sort of what's going on in the larger world of theology that gives context for this debate. And I think the the coordinates you pointed out uh, just a second ago sort of help us help us see that. So maybe I'll move on to this next question, which is what do you think are some of the, we, we've, we've touched at this maybe in fact implicitly already, but we can get at it explicitly. What are some of the, I don't know, potential sins on each side of this debate? In other words, there's, uh, this isn't just complicated conceptually. Uh, it's we, we live in a complicated period of theological history. We we live in a very com- uh, a very complicated environment in which we're doing theology, um, and presumably there are risks on each side of the debate uh, between roughly, if I could put it this way, fathers and theological fathers and theological sons. Uh, <laughs> if we could keep that father-son motif going, uh, uh, there are perhaps some sin risks on each side. And I wonder if you could, I, I, I might have a, I'll throw in a couple of my own thoughts about that as well, but I wonder if you have some thoughts about that. Uh, it's a really good question. It's a really critical question, I think, to uh, ask ourselves and ask ourselves also individually, lest we, uh, you know, take advantage of pointing out sins in others and not bring them home to our own hearts. Um, but I think precisely being aware of the possible dynamics that can accrue from having a father-son relationship is, is really informative of the potential sins that could plague uh, wherever you find yourself on that, on that spectrum. Uh, I, 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 at least speaking for myself, is one who leans toward the son uh, certainly towards the sun uh, area of that dynamic. Uh, maybe some of the real warnings that particularly the guys on the classical theism side ought to be aware of. Uh, you know, you, you have the old guys uh, who are the fathers of the faith, who are our fathers in the faith, who've worked for years. And then you have, on the other hand, the young club saying that these, these guys have got it all wrong. Uh, that might be right. Uh, and the simple fact that someone is old or young and the position is old or new or, or what have you doesn't make it true, doesn't make it false. But this is a familiar dynamic. We've seen this. We should all be aware of this. And I think understanding of the frustration that our uh, former generations can, can genuinely and legitimately have with younger guys who, who need to just kind of calm down a little bit, perhaps. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I know I know for myself some of the dynamic arises because questions are being asked like why wasn't I taught this? Uh, why wasn't I taught this in seminary? Why was I taught wrong for so long? Uh, but one thing that's been critical to realize I think is that the older generation just didn't have the sorts of resources or opportunities that we seem to have available to us at the moment. Now that can be a statement that follows from privileging the present over the past in a way that's very imbalanced. Uh, But here, I think it certainly obtains. You just have to realize that the 20th century for Protestants primarily is in a special time of intellectual darkness and poverty. And nowadays, uh, we have plenty of problems of our own. Problems are often different, and perhaps we have light in some area of, of theology that past generation wasn't so clear on. But our situation is so different. We have the return of many who know Latin, who are able to access the riches of church history as they work through these questions. And we even have things like Google Books and PRDL. And these two factors alone are all you need to realize we're in a very much a different state of affairs today. Uh, The fact that I can sit here in my closet in my pajamas 
and read works that were published in the 12th century or the 17th century, and all of these are available to me at my fingertips, is simply not been possible up until like five, 10 years ago. And this has drastically changed the name of the game and, and something that we ought, to, we ought to be sensitive to as we're speaking to the older generation as they deal with these issues. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that. I think that's, I think that's crucial. And I, think, and I think it's also crucial to point out that um, it, it's, uh, you framed it in terms of like there was a, there's a way in which uh, uh, there was some theological darkness in, in, you know, sort of in the last hundred years. I think, you know, it's also fair to say that there's, uh, in other areas at least, there's theological light, there's theological vantage point to uh, to living in the modern world and working out theology in that context. And a lot of the fights I think that our fathers were engaged in were very real and very important. Uh, and often they were exemplars in those fights. And I think we owe a lot of gratitude to that, uh, toward them for that. Um, uh, you know, I see this, I see the dynamic as kind of like, a, you know, sort of having our theological boomer parents our, our, our boomer person, theological personalists with, a, with our, our young buck, you know, sort of, you know, millennial theological scholastics, right? You know, there's this, you know, and all the, the boomer, the boomer millennial, uh, you know, tensions are sort of brought, brought in there. Uh, you see, you see them it's, repeated here. It's, it's um, funny and it's somewhat of a joke, you know, we say this in a joking way, but it's really quite, quite astute to realize that and think about that and then ask yourself, okay, how, how am I to behave uh, as this young buck millennial? Uh, right. You, you, you know, we, we are all aware in the areas of, you know, of life that don't have purchase on, on the question of theology, that there's structured relationships that have to be navigated very carefully. And Paul is extremely explicit to the younger millennial generation in the sins that, that attend them particularly that they have to watch out for and, and I right think probably very wary of those and i think i think it's crucial i think it's crucial to say that uh, this is one thing i would say and, and maybe it's a little controversial and uh, you, you don't have to own it nobody has to own it but one thing i'd want to say is that i think um to some extent, you know, you, you think at the final, you know, we've often thought that at the final judgment, you're judged against your knowledge, you know, you're judged against what's available to you, what you know. Very much. Um, and I think sometimes our theological fathers, you know, you've mentioned we, we have more access to certain resources, there are certain categories which are clearer to us. Sometimes our theological fathers are making uh, against their their perceived backdrop of options you know so if they think there's a particular issue and there's only three options to take on this sometimes i read their books and i think you know given the way that they're interpreting the available options they're they're making a fairly responsible judgment yes. now my disagreement with them is that i think there are other options yes. but but you can see even in, in in sometimes when you read some of the older guys on aquinas for instance um sometimes you know, their, their presentation of Aquinas is something I reject as well. You know, their take on Aquinas, if, if that's what Aquinas is doing, and my only option is what they're saying versus what they think Aquinas is saying, well, they're correct. That's a much better option than the, than the, than the projection of Aquinas. Um, and I think we need to factor all that in. And part of that then is to say that we need to, uh, you know, you know what, what's helpful here is to have a different reading of Aquinas or, or other, other, it's not just Aquinas, it's other sources. I think one other thing worth saying is that I think sometimes our, uh, you know, our fathers perceive in kind of the young buck millennials um, a kind of traditionalism that is criticizable and is not particularly Protestant. And, it, and there's a lot of movements these days. There's a lot of movements. It's not just us. It's not just our kind of uber confessionalist sorts or anything. There's a lot of movements in modernity and among millennials that take this form, particularly among, you know, sort of conservative millennial movements. Um, and I think it goes something like this. I, I, I think it's important to, uh, I think it's important for us to be perceived as people who aren't making judgments just because that's the way the creeds or just because that's the way the, the, the medievals or even the, the, reformed, uh, the reformed confessions made those judgments. In other words, theology is not about regurgitation. Uh, it's not about um, outsourcing our judgment. Um, 
theology is largely about a healthy relationship to those things, even if we make those exact same judgments, even if we receive those judgments, it's always a contemporary exercise. It's always a, an exercise, it's always a judgment we're making and receiving and internalizing and making ourselves right now. Uh, and I think sometimes it's kind of clear, you can kind of read between the lines, you read people and it's like, you know what, they're not, they're more or less regurgitating previous judgments. They're not exactly internalizing and making them themselves. Uh, and I think that you can smell that off the page sometimes. And I, and I understand why that's uh, more or less uh, uh, off-putting, uh, I guess you yeah. could say, to our father. To, and, to the... and, and I, I, yeah, I think that's 100% right. I've often said theology is a word in the present tense. It's, it's only something that, that the church is confessing now. Uh, not not to the point where it's historically myopic, but right. to the point that exactly the, what you said, it's not simply regurgitation. And it's also something that's not worth noting that, you know, in the present dynamic, the, the deck is somewhat stacked against the classical theists, the CT guys, uh, because e even if they genuinely don't uh, fall prey to you know, this, this weird, weird creedality that uh, attempts to exalt some, some formalism. It's a new, it's a new manualism. It's, it's that Catholic manualism that really plagued the Roman Catholic church for a number of generations, especially in the 19th century. Uh, you know, even if they're not falling prey to that, they still often look like it because they're, they're espousing what Thomas Aquinas said. And what Thomas Aquinas said it's good enough then, it's good enough for now, and why are you new guys, right? So, and then we have the new, the new guys who are advancing other things, and, and they're genuinely wanting to be systematic in the sense of using the contemporary resources that we have, which are different, different, you know, versions of philosophy, these sorts of things, to parse out theological understanding in as much as we can. And yeah, so it's a dynamic that you can just predict how it's going to go and yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of on that way. Yeah. Um, I think also your former point regarding, uh, you know, a, a lot of these guys in the 20th century, especially uh, are interpreting various figures of history against the readings that they, they've been given, what, what their immediate backdrop is and their, and their, their feel for the various options. Uh, I've often said, a lot of the the, the Vantillians, to to, uh, to pick on my Vantillian brothers just a moment, mm. uh, a lot of their their readings of Thomas are precisely those readings that the, the Roman Catholic Church was advancing for many generations, and then realized they were advancing, especially in the early 20th century, and purposely rejected as mm. unfaithful to Thomas and unfaithful to what the Roman Catholic position always was. And so you have these Van Tills and sort of that strain of doing theology who are responding to a very much impoverished view of Thomas. I, I remember sitting in seminary and, and seeing, you know, receiving from the, 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 the visiting professor who he, he, he was just a visiting professor. He's describing Thomas Aquinas and I'm sitting there and saying, this bears zero resemblance to the Thomas that I'm reading in the Summa, or the Thomas that I'm reading presented to me in the mid 20th century, by, you know, by the time of the mid, mid 20th century. And part of the issue is that it doesn't seem that Vantillians ever actually realized that, no, there's the Thomistic resourcement that happened after Pope Leo XIII in 1879 called for it, right? And we should, we should, we should update our critiques of Thomas based upon that. And, and, and so you're right, when they're fed these sort of options, they're responsibly adjudicating those issues and then spitting out an answer that, you know, many of us when given those options would select today. Yeah, that's right. Um, so let's, let's get a little deeper in the issues themselves. You know, uh, we're sympathetic, I think you and I, and, and many, you know, to, to, to some biblicist concerns, you know, how do we respond to, to these sorts who are, who, who are attracted, and you understand why, you know, you're attracted to scripture's kind of phenomenological and visceral language about God, and you're worried 
that the classical approach is kind of pastorally or costly. You know, the, the classic example here, of course, is that Thomas uses this language of, you know, God not being really related to the world. And, you know, the pastors freak out everywhere. What? You know, God's not related to us. You know, not a great sermon title, right? You know, like, but how do we, you know, how do we address that? How do we, how do we address the pastoral concern that's at play in sort of, you know, are we, are we trading scriptures, you know, we could call it this on a certain way, kind of person-like language about God that's, that's, that means something to us. You know, it comforts us all the years. We read this, it's, that's the language that really hits home for most people. Are we trading that for this kind of, um, kind of dry, arid metaphysical language? How do we help us, help us work through that? Yeah, I'm incredibly sensitive to this concern in the sense that I feel it very deeply every day. Uh, I feel it very much in my own calling because I'm cognizant of the fact that most of the work that I'm doing, I, I wouldn't really want any layperson reading or thinking about. And, you know, I try to talk to my mother at times. She asks me, what, what, what are you working on in theology? And, and you, you know, you don't want to present the dry area of metaphysics because it's, 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 poten- it's potentially quite destructive to most people. And I do think that at least initially, it's really important to attend carefully to just that reality, that it's legitimate, at least in my opinion, to restrict systematics to higher academic levels that are totally inaccessible to most all lay people and even sometimes a lot of pastors. And and advancing that as a valid methodological resolution of somewhat of the situation we find ourselves where you have CT guys arguing against biblicist guys, you know, at the same level for the same territory. Uh, You know, I I think that this is a valid method. It's not intended to promote any sort of hierarchy uh, with theologians at the top. It's rather convenient to say, well, you know, we're just going to maintain ourselves up here and you, uh, you know, you, you peasants down there can, can ten, continue to think of your biblicist views of God. It, that's not it at all. Um, but rather, it's to note that the purpose of systematics is seeking understanding of the truth broadly, not saying the truth, right? These are, these are two different things, and there are two different methods, and there are different fields. It's far beyond the question of what is a professional or academic way of doing theology, and what is a layperson way of doing theology? It's rather recognizing that one is systematics, and one is much closer to what you know most people would call something like a dogmatics or or a simple exposition of scripture. What we ought to say, what we ought to believe, what is in fact the case. When we move up to the systematics, we're not abandoning what is the case, but we're seeking understanding of that. And in order to seek understanding, we're using conceptual tools and categories that are very much and openly not in scripture, but they're used to shed light on what what we're saying and and confessing in the creeds and the various confessional formulae that the church is given. Uh, And as as far as I can tell, uh, at least in my judgment, saying the truth creedily confessing the truth, the, the, the realm of dogmatics is going to be very closely allied with the language of scripture. It's going to be minimally jargon heavy. It's going to be a rare use of philosophical technicalities. Overall, it's going to be not scholastic. This is what the preacher is going to be saying on Sunday, and that's okay. This is the confession of the faith that all Christians are called to, and it seems to me most of the biblicist sorts are actually rightly motivated to, to speak to, and that's broadly the audience that they're concerned to preserve. A lot of them are pastors themselves, and, and they realize any seminary guy gets up and he preaches some crazy sermon about God not being related to the world and going to the metaphysics of, of relations, it's going to destroy people's faith. And I think that concern <laughs> is, is, is right and is something that I want to preserve. But what I want to also equally preserve is just because you don't do it in the pulpit doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Right. The calling of the theologian is to push for an understanding of the faith as far as understanding can be had in this life. And what theologians do is they go about this task with, with a high degree of precision, a high degree of conceptual vocabulary that is refined by philosophy and these sorts of things. And when that happens, 
the technical turning of the various dogmas confessed by the church throughout all ages takes on such a precision that it's going to be nearly unrecognizable to the non-initiate. It's going to bring with it its own set of requirements, its own tools, its own ends, because it's simply a different field. And this is why, and I've said this for years, I, I don't find it likely that it's healthy for most Christians to know really anything about something like the divine simplicity, for example. Uh, this has been a, a main point of dispute for a number of years. You go online, everyone's all about the divine simplicity. I don't find it very healthy. And this is where I sign, side with the biblicist to find most lay people knowing really very much about the divine simplicity at all, much less thinking that they understand it when they don't. I don't right. think that we're... Yeah. Maybe it's helpful in like a super rough way, like, uh, uh, you know, you, you can know that God's judgment, uh, is a, is, is a judgment, a loving judgment. You know, you can, you can kind of pair attributes or something like this, you know, you can say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, well that, so that, that, you know, I, you know, maybe want to clarify that, that, you know, what simplicity does is really important for people to, to know how to do and to be doing, you know, kind of automatically, but all the technical uh, arguing about the divine simplicity doesn't seem to me to be very helpful. And, and it, it seems to equip, uh, poorly equip a number of folks who are in quite a lot of danger of, of misunderstanding and of presenting severe misunderstanding to others as well. And I've seen, I've just seen the situation evolve. I see right. a lot of guys who are you know, they're presenting the divine simplicity that either entails immediately or perhaps it, it, you know, you can get there by deduction, some sort of radical apophaticism, a radical agnosticism that they or others aren't able going to climb, are, they're just not going to be able to, to climb out of in, in any quick or easy way. Uh, they think if God is his attributes, then the attributes mean nothing at all, and they're just things that we say that are not true of God and et cetera, et cetera. This is a very bad place to be. And I think that a lot of guys are, are very close to that, if not there entirely. Let me, let me ask a, a, a clarifying question or, or two. Some people might be a little confused because we typically, um, you're using the phrase dogmatic, the dogmatics and systematics a little bit differently. Uh, and I want to say that a lot of people will probably get the have the impression that uh, to speak of you know Herman Bovink titles it reform dogmatics isn't that a systematic theology? Uh, but it seems like you're distinguishing the two terms. How how would you help us grasp what what is it to do dogmatics versus to do systematics? I think you've implicitly kind of clear, said already, but I just in case people are like, wait, you, you move between those two terms, help us grasp the, the distinction between those two terms. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Uh, in Protestant theology, especially, uh, you know, you mentioned Herman Bavink. I, I find this a lot in the Dutch circles. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why. Perhaps it's a language thing. I, I really don't know. But there's often they're calling dogmatics what's, what's actually technically systematics. So at least using this distinction, dogmatics are those things which are confessed as fact or as true or as reality, whereas systematics is uh, the realm of seeking understanding of what is true, which is covered in dogmatics. So you might picture it this way. Dogmatics is very simply stating what is the case, and systematics is trying to understand how it's the case. Right? So these, these are, these are okay. two very different fields. And, and there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of mutual back and forth. You know, the, the, there's no... They're not isolated spheres. Systematics takes its immediate po point of departure from some dogmatic statement, uh, some confession that this is true, that this is the case, and then tries to cycle through that in a very technical way to gain some understanding. And once systematics has done its task, then it offers up its understanding for the judgment, again, of dogmatics. So it's this, it's this cycle of faith-seeking understanding. Dogmatics belongs to faith, what faith says, what faith affirms. The seeking understanding part is the job of the systematician, the job of the theologian. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe... Not, well, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead and finish. 
Well, I'm just saying not having a clear understanding of, of one's methods and one's tasks and these sorts of things, it, it does land you in these sorts of messes. Uh, as, I, as I read the situation, the, bibl the biblicist theologians are wanting to do dogmatics and are very concerned about it. And this is good. I think dogmatics, broadly speaking, is where the realm of biblical theology is, should be placed in a certain way. I, I, I think biblical theology is something else than than uh, you know theology properly speaking but the the language of creeds the language of confessions the language of things that are being asserted bible commentaries all of these belong in some way to the dogmatic sphere they might not be pure dogmatics you know bible commentaries not pure dogmatics the the assertion of this is what the scripture is saying here but it it belongs in that sphere whereas mm. the systematician the theologian he takes what's given to him and seeks some understanding of it. And you've, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, we we're not to expect that every Christian, you know, should be able to parse out, you know, all of these systematic the, the theology categories or, or be, you know, sort of contribute even perhaps directly to the systematic project. And yet presumably there's something in systematics for the whole church and that maybe, maybe it's not direct, maybe it's not immediate, but over time, um, uh, syst you know, insights of systematic theology, maybe we could say high metaphysical truths, uh, uh, maybe filter down into expressions that are insightful on an ordinary level. Can you talk about maybe how do you, how do you envision, how does, how do those high points in systematic reflection finally make their way over time to the ground? Is there, a, is there a way we could say, articulate how that works? Yeah, well, well certainly, you know, every Christian, I, I want to be clear, every Christian is called to seek some understanding of the faith. Uh, you know, when, when you believe something, you're immediately compelled to try to understand it further. This feeds your faith. And this is broadly speaking, growing in your knowledge of God. So this is something that is proper to every Christian, regardless of their, their formal calling. But when you're talking about an actual discipline of theology, when you're, when I'm talking about systematics with a capital S, you know, big, big, big systematics, academic systematics, what, what have you, um, that's where, it, it takes on a formality that's going to be foreign to most people. Uh, the, the way of navigating the, uh, the technical big, big, you know, big S systematics down to the, the little S systematics that, you know, grandma Jane does in the pew is, is very difficult. Uh, and I, and I can't pretend to, to be highly informed as, as to how to make that jump. I, it's, it's not my skill set personally. It's, it's, actually something I, I rather struggle with. But that's where I think the role of pastors and the role of various offices of the church comes into play, where you have theologians, you have pastors, you have, uh, you know, elders and all these sorts of things that are able to be that lively connection between the, the range of understanding that every individual is able and in fact will obtain. Yeah. All of us are gifted with a certain amount of conceptual uh, apparatus. We all have certain sized brains and yeah. we all have callings that are, you know, that delimit, you, you might have a, a very strong, uh, a very big brain as it were, but you're called to be a, a physicist and not a theologian. So you need to use that big brain elsewhere, you know, these sorts of things. But this is where the lively linkage of the church comes in and everyone follows their calling. And this doesn't mean anyone's better than anybody else, of course. Right. I've often said the theologians are basically the dishwashers of the church. They're the ones in the back that nobody sees that are scrubbing all the crud off your plate. So <laughs> that the preachers can be the ones, you know, this famous illustration, the preachers are just the waiters who bring the food out to the people and they're not supposed to mess it up. Well, the theologians are in the back and they're just washing the dishes. So, you know, this isn't a gradation or a hierarchy, but, it's just a delimitation of tasks. Right. There's a, there's an interesting reflection in Lewis and, and I, uh, I find him interesting because he, uh, I've been reading his book miracles lately. Um, uh, and what's interesting in miracles is that I get the sense that he's actually playing a lot uh, in the first five or six chapters 
with the medieval discussion of the transcendental properties of being, but he's not calling them that. And he's speaking in very plain, and I'm thinking of this task of theological mediation. He's not getting into all the technicalities of that language, but he's sort of, he's sort of taking what, uh, what is accessible in that language, and he's just brilliantly communicating it to ordinary people. And he also, in one of the chapters, talks about how he thinks the modern situation is particularly... The modern situation is particularly weird in that um, uh, a lot of the old language is gone. You know, we've been sort of, sort of, uh, we've been sort of cultivated again away from an old philosophical and theological tradition, mm -hmm. and now we're left with nothing. We're or we're left not with nothing. We're left with kind of a vacuum. Uh, and he and he poses a couple of options, and one of them is sort of like, well, we can we can say, uh, or actually, let me let me back up. What he actually says is that. One of our options, uh, what, what used to happen is that the kind of the wisdom of sages, if you will, uh, uh, was mediated to the common people uh, by means of authority and tradition. I mean, this is how most civilizations have worked. Yes. Um, and what's happened in modernity is that we've kind of gotten rid of the wisdom of authority and sages and we haven't replaced it with anything. And so he says, now, 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 we, now the common man, uh, the way he puts it is the common man now bears a burden kind of metaphysically that he's never born in the history of the yeah. human race. And so what he says is there's kind of two options now. We can either go back to this we can either say you got to go back to relying on sages because you know if there's no sagely wisdom to be found, well, we're all screwed basically. Um, but another option is actually for civilization to progressively move in the direction of sagedom. That is to say, for to and Lewis is quite explicit about this, and I was quite surprised. But he basically says like maybe in divine providence, part of the goal is actually for more and more persons to become. Uh, theologically and philosophically educated in a way that would have been surprising in the past. Now, I don't think he's thinking this is going to happen tomorrow, but you could say like, on the one hand, um, maybe one way of reading the modern situation through that Louisian lens, perhaps, is to say there's a lot of uh, bad theology on the ground in the church these days, but it's actually a lot better. <laughs> in terms of what's actually internalized, there's ways in which uh, the distribution of truth is actually wider, and perhaps the trajectory over time will be toward a um, toward a, a greater degree of mediation of that kind of higher knowledge to more common persons. Now, of course, again, that's thinking in a very long-term historical development. It's kind of speculative, but it's yeah. worth... Uh, and of course, I think that's what he's himself is trying to accomplish. What Lewis and his own his own corpus, I think, is trying to accomplish is actually precisely the mediation of what was formerly kind of high knowledge in plain language, you know. Yeah. And that's a project I think that's very worth um, uh, very worth pursuing, and can be and, and is going to be more liable to error than to accuracy in a lot of cases, uh, but is nevertheless worth you know worth something in, in principle. And uh, I think part of the exciting motions of modernity, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, uh, for us. Well, um, how, how though, maybe a, a next question following up from that last one, you know, how do we make sure that philosophy doesn't drive the faith? You know, this is another concern here is like, are we, are we making the philosophical tail wag the exegetical dog? Um, you know, that's a legitimate concern to have. How would you respond to that concern? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a hard question. Um, I think the first thing in, in trying to answer that question is to avoid operating on the assumption that it needs to be answered <laughs> in the sense <laughs> that there actually is a competition or antithesis to be resolved between philosophy mm. and theology. I think generally speaking, when that question is posed, the inherent assumption is, oh boy, we've got a, a problem, a butting of heads that uh, we have to resolve like two warring children, you know, separate them into their various rooms and, and maybe they'll quiet down or grow up or, or what have you. And yeah, I think that's a very, that's a false move. It just doesn't work. And, it's, and it doesn't conform to reality either because we know that God is the one author, both of nature and grace. There's not going to be any issue of double truth to be resolved between natural theology and supernatural. God is the one author of both. And, our point of departure then, you know, in trying to at least explain how we approach this sort of question is to leave off of perfect harmony that's assumed. 
uh, between philosophy and theology. It doesn't mean that nature and grace or natural theology and supernatural theology are, are, are of the same sphere. And, you know, they're, they're absolutely not. Nor does it mean that they're on equal levels. Uh, because, once again, they're not. Supernatural theology is the higher order. It's an order which is wholly out of reach of all natural theology. Uh, absolutely speaking, all of the natural principles that are endued at creation are not going to generate supernatural theology. Um, this, this is really important to understand. So they're, they're, they're not spheres that uh, are close to each other, but they're not equal partners on this task of speaking of the real speaking of the real, whether we're talking about the world or we're talking about God and, and all these sorts of things. So we just have to parse the relationship with, with, with great, with great care. Um, for, for the uninitiated precisely, uh, you know, we've lost some of this language. Can you briefly delineate when you say natural versus supernatural theology? Uh, what's that distinction for most people? Um, so natural theology is uh, the, the speech about God that is uh, generated only by looking at creation and only by using reason. Supernatural theology is that speech about God, which is generated from scripture or special revelation broadly, because uh, you know, there could be times in the history of the church where God reveals something that is not in scripture. But for all intents and purposes today, Theology that's generated from scripture and held by faith. Okay, right. And presumably there's some overlap between those things in that there's some, some things that scripture states that are just fairly consonant with natural theology. There are, there are uh, many, many, many statements of scripture that uh, are available for natural reason and the creation to inform us of. Right. right. Uh, it's important to recognize that that doesn't devalue scripture statements. When scripture tells us, you know, this, this, this attribute of God and this attribute of God, all of those attributes are available to natural reason to deduce from itself, but it's not going to do them so quickly. It's not going to do, deduce them with, with the same degree of certainty because our, you know, supernatural theology is that which participates in God's own knowledge. And so it has the higher degree of authority and we get it faster because we can take God at his word. So yeah, it's very true that natural reason and uh, our natural theology and many, many, many parts of scripture are going to overlap pra practically in what they say about God. Um, but there are, there are also many things that scripture contains that reason can never deduce. Right. Which is not to say they're unreasonable, but to say that they're uh, non-deducible from reason. Is that? Yeah, that that's right. So you know, there, again, there's a lot of technical clarifications that you want to make, but yeah, that's a, that's a good one uh, to start off with. It's not saying that uh, there's an introduction of some sort of paradox or some sort of uh, radical irrationalism that attends the faith. Uh, rather, it is to assert that there are many things that are beyond reason's ability to either grasp or come upon with its own, with its own powers. Uh, this is why supernatural theology is described as a higher order in the sense that it's beyond the reach of reason on its own, on its own steam. Right? Mm. And even when faith is assumed and when faith is operative, uh, it's not precisely the, the, the rational uh, equipment of an individual, which is needing to be operated by supernatural theology. Rather, it's the principle of faith. Right. Uh, even if we get the relationship right between natural and supernatural theology or faith and reason in principle, um, is there a case to be made that the classical approach to God is in fact rooted in scripture? Um, uh, you know, did, were the were the medievals, for instance, you know, doing you know fine grained exegesis uh, when they were trying to to move uh, from scripture to dogmatics to classical theology? Yeah, uh, this is a really this is this is where a lot of the nub is. Um, you know, starting with the presumption, which not everyone's going to accept, but starting with the presumption that the natural order and the supernatural order are 
partners in this task, unequal partners, unequally yoked, as it were, in this <laughs> task of, of speaking about God, um, it, it, it's, it's something of a non-problem that shouldn't concern us too much. Uh, you know, a lot of guys throw out this objection. And again, it's, it rests on the assumption that uh, what is available to natural reason is going to be somehow needing to be you know, further corrected or what have you by scripture. It's not, it's not the way it, it happens. So but for those who are motivated to really press and discover the various attributes of God, for instance, in scripture, uh, particularly those that are uh, cast in a more and more metaphysical hue, things like simplicity. Um, yeah, you can get there eventually, but it's going to be very, very, very far from the express language of scripture. And this is where, again, it's important to note what we're doing and what our tasks are. Mm. Is our task to, simply speaking, stand up on Sunday and exposit this passage of scripture and say what it says? Or is our task to push for the deepest understanding that we can have of the truths that are revealed in this, in this passage of scripture? Depending on what you're doing, your answers are going to look very different. You know, pre Preacher Bob on Sunday is not going to be doing metaphysics in the pulpit. But, you know, the theologian Joe over here shouldn't be doing biblical commenting in his systematics. You know, so this is, this, these are different tasks. Hmm. Hmm. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, well, actually, before I get to the next question, I'll just make a comment there. You know, it seems to me this is this was always one of the concerns I guess I had when I, as I've been working through these things with classical theology and biblical exegesis is I'm I'm sympathetic to the to the claim that a lot of the proof texting, for instance, for some of the classical attributes, don't quite get all the job done. Maybe they gesture a little bit. Maybe they gesture some in the direction of where we want to go with our with our systematic and dogmatic formulations, but they don't get you all the way there. And so I've you know, and so I felt in, certainly in myself some desire to say, how do we link up? Kind of, if I could put it this way, these biblical gestures toward maybe a natural climax when combined with. Uh, certain questions that we have. So it seems to me that a lot of what's going on in these classical formulations is the combination of biblical gestures with particular questions that human beings are asking, which are good questions that nat arise naturally from being creatures with reason, uh, trying to figure out how, you know, again, that statement you made, how these statements are true, and that maybe what, so, so exegesis perhaps is that um, uh, a cat, that catalyst uh, it's again engaging gesturing in a particular direction, but it takes the climactic work. I mean, part of systematics, it seems to me, is asking questions. It's asking questions that we have of the text and about reality and trying to understand how they fit together. And maybe our formulations kind of spill out of that combination rather than yep. sort of just leap right off the page of scripture. Though I want to say one thing that you discovered. Yeah. You, uh, you and I have been talking uh, behind the scenes a bit, and not surprising. Uh, but one thing you've, you've been discovering in your own research is that uh, there's a lost pile of exegesis in the medievals uh, that, is, uh, that people don't realize is there, really fine-grained exegesis. Can you uh, briefly uh, uh, spill the beans there a little bit? Uh, tell, tell, pe tell people what's there that they've never read or even heard about. <laughs> yeah, no, no I... I... I think that's a that's a po definitely a point worth noting. Uh, Thomas Thomas was first a Bible commentator before he was a theologian, before he was a philosopher, before before he began commenting on the sentences of Peter Lombard, which was the theological textbook during that time period. And in order to become a professional theologian and use terms uh, that we would use today, your job was to comment on the sentences. So write your thoughts, your, your very robust thoughts on the sentences. And, uh, well, before you get to there, you, you're a Bible commentator and not just, not just a reader, but you're actually writing Bible commentaries. So Thomas wrote Bible commentaries on Matthew, on John, on most all of Paul's epistles, on the book of Hebrews, he wrote a Bible commentary on Jeremiah, on Job, on Isaiah. Uh, 
you know, this is what, what is this maybe 15, 17 common trees? I don't have the number before me, unfortunately, but this is an astounding amount of Bible commentary. And you give me a, a systematic theologian today who's all, you know, upset about, oh, systematics is not so biblical and we need to have more biblical commentary in our systematics and needs to be closer, closer to the Bible and these sorts of things. There's no theologian who's written even two commentaries on the scripture. Here, here, Thomas, even before he begins, has done all this commentary work. And that's, that's just, to, you know, the no, kind of the normal pathway of theological education. You start with the, the glosses on the text. And, uh, your, and your, theologic, your, your theology does rise out of that. It also can rise out of natural theology because, again, there's no antithesis. So right. no matter how you get there, you know, you're, you're going to get there, or at least you can get there in principle. And then in, in addition, and you mentioned this, their point of departure for their, their uh, speculative theology is often just the very, very simple quotation of a Bible verse. So I point this out very frequently. Thomas, as he begins question 27, which is the very first question of the Summa, that starts to deal with the Trinity, the proof, the, the, the proof that starts his entire meditation on the Trinity is, is a quotation from John 8, where Jesus said, I proceeded from the Father. That's it. That starts his, his meditation on Trinity, which is perhaps one of the conceptually dense pieces on Trinity ever written. It's incredible. Hmm. It starts from Scripture. Now, the fact that he, and you kind of mentioned this, you know, using Scripture as a springboard, and when you give the final results to, to someone, and you've jumped very, very high off of the springboard, Sometimes the springboard that you jumped off of to get there isn't so clear, right? And people need to understand that, yeah, most of these metaphysical attributes certainly don't jump off the page to you on your first read or on your second read or, you know, maybe your hundredth read, or maybe, maybe they never will to you because you don't have a training or you can't get there or whatever. But the scholastics are always very intentional. You can debate with them that maybe, oh, you went the wrong way, but they're always very intentionally unfolding the scripture. It's just sometimes we listen in on the conversation and they've unfolded so far from scripture that they've, you know, scripture is not immediately present to our view and their process of getting there also because it includes, uh, you know, a, a willingness to, to use philosophy and natural theology uh, on par in the sense of, you know, what's true is true and there's no, there's no better, worse truths, these sorts of things. The process that they've gotten uh, to the point where we're deriving the reality of a divine pr procession eternally from a simple statement in John 8 isn't always so clear. So when we come along behind them and we're, we're giving the results of their systematic meditation, as they've, they've, they've gotten this height of understanding from, from the scripture, we should understand that difference. And again, it's not as though we can just assume, oh, you know, they've gotten to here, we can start from here, right? We have to be performing that as well. Right. But when people critique, for instance, the divine simplicity, again, I, I hate to continue to mention that, but everyone likes to talk about the divine simplicity as not being, you know, there's no proof text for divine simplicity. And all of these proof texts, which are listed in the older commentators are just bogus. And we know better now because we're better, you know, we're better commentators. Well, no, they just assumed that there was a very long process of reasoning that started from that text, which arrived at their theological point. Right. But they're not Moving saying from the what to the how from, from the yeah. what to the how and, and very, very far into the how as it were. Yeah, this is correct. Right. And I, I want to say that um, in a conversation, you had told me that you had been reading some medieval manuscripts that were uh, talking about Trinitarian persons and were just thoroughly, thoroughly exegetical, but almost un, almost unread manuscripts. I can't remember who you were referring to, yeah, but I, uh, I think the conversation you're mentioning. I, I was uh, uh, reading through all of the you know 13th century or so scholastics on the divine missions, and was very struck. I believe it was Albert the Great. Uh, it was either Albert or Bonaventure, but I believe it was Albert the Great, who was the teacher of Thomas Aquinas, uh, in a sentence commentary on the divine missions. He's going through and he's clarifying uh, and talking about all these different aspects, mission, a giving, you know, all these different words, all of which are just sim simply words that are found in scripture. And yeah, he, you know, okay, uh, the Bible talks about 
the divine person giving himself. Well, now we have to have a, a, an explanation of what that means and these sorts of things. And so, yeah, they're profoundly biblical and, and they're taking their departure from, from the very simple assertions of what scripture says. Um, mm. and, 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 and might it be added as well, at least in the, in the mind of Thomas Aquinas, the only uh, sense of scripture that can allow you or prompt you to theological reasoning and understanding as you seek, the, you know, understanding of the faith is the literal sense. It's not any other sense. Um, and you could argue that maybe, maybe sometimes they're, they're a little fishy on that move, but that's an important thing. So even when we look at the Bible commentators and we kind of thumb our noses at, at guys of times past who, uh, you know, oh boy, we really wish they had the moderns and they, and they understood you know, the literal senses, the way and these sorts of things. Well, they all agree, or at least those who are Thomists, that the only sense that's relevant for theology as a science is the literal sense. And mm. it's an important note as well. Hmm. Well, as we're, as we're moving toward the end here, you know, uh, though this is controversial to some people, I, I think it's clear that nobody should claim that we can't still develop our understanding of the Trinity. We can't still develop our doctrine of God. The whole history of uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is a is, is the history of a developing doctrine, uh, and the church has been more deeply attempting uh, to understand the mystery of the Trinity for two thousand years. What are what do you think, in your judgment, are some promising lines of uh, of development in both the exegetical and systematic spheres in the Trinity these days? Uh, you know, there's a lot of works, a lot of it, you know, presumably you don't care too much for, but presumably there's something that you care for. And uh, uh, in one in particular, I guess, an add-on question there, what in particular are you working on? Uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I would definitely agree that, you know, the nature of understanding is that it's always cumulative and synthetic. We can parse that in terms of an individual. So some theologian grows throughout his whole life and he attains more and more understanding of the mysteries of God. We can articulate that in terms of the corporate church and various of its stripes. And it's, it's really, you're, you're right to mention that it is possible to continue. Maybe I don't want to say ad infinitum, but you know, for a very, very long time, at least to develop our understanding, but it's also critical to note that, it doesn't mean necessarily that we're increasing dogma, uh, that we're increasing uh, what, we're, what we're confessing, the truth. Um, very, very rare would it happen that we're advancing dogma and exceedingly unlikely with respect to something like the Trinity, I suppose. As, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I suppose as a Protestant, I might want to leave that door open. I don't really know, but I'm, I'm very suspicious of someone who thinks that they've advanced a dogmatic question on, on the Trinity in any degree. Um, the only thing that perhaps uh, comes to mind, and, and I, I could get myself in trouble for this, I suppose, but, but perhaps something like the Filioque controversy could be resolved. Uh, you know, the, the, the Latin West would, would like to say, oh, we've already resolved it. Well, uh, you, you know, there, there's half of the church here that, you know, so something like that perhaps could, could have an increase of dogma, but that would be, would be an incredibly rare circumstance. And, and broadly speaking is, outside the pale of any humanly speaking possibility. So, you know, we have our foundational commitments that are set. They're set basically in stone, as it were. They're set on the basis of supernatural relation, uh, revelation in, in the, uh, the dogmatic creeds of the church, the church's expression with one voice of what is to be believed. But beyond that, yeah, we, we grow in our understanding. And, and I do think there, there are some promising lines of development. You're right to say that you know, I, I wouldn't be too happy with some areas of Trinitarian theology today, but there's definitely promising lines. Um, I think the most significant line in, I'm really going to show my cards here, but yeah, it's by the by, is, uh, would be re the recovery of Aristotelianism, and specifically that of the uh, Thomist variety. There's been no, uh, at least in my opinion, there's been no greater metaphysics uh, greater in, this, in, in the service of the faith than that advanced by Thomas. So primarily, this is going to have to do with two arenas, especially that are pertinent to Trinity, the handling of essay or being. Uh, this, of course, is central to any work on God. You have to, you have to be very adept at, at handling the issue of being, and uh, particularly the way of, of, of knowing. So, you know, we have Thomas uh, resources being developed 
respect to essay or, or regained with respect to essay, and then also with respect to knowledge, um, because it's critical to articulate the fact that intellectual emanation, which is the analogy for the divine persons who proceed, is the intellectual emanation of, you know, finite knowers. And it doesn't seem like there's ever going to be any more significant analogy that's going to be discovered or could possibly be discovered for, for various reasons that I won't go into here. Uh, and so, yeah, the recovery of, of epistemology or an ontology of knowledge from an Aristotelianism or a Thomist perspective is really extremely important for the issue of intellectual emanation, which is a certain species of the psychological analogy. Um, it's a certain, certain type of the psychological analogy. So to speak. So we have essay, um, we have knowing, and then I think maybe a third would be the issue of analogia, uh, analogy of being analogia antis. Uh, and this has become something of a fad in postmodern metaphysics, especially. Um, so, you know, we have metaphysics that's after modernism, especially as Thomas develops uh, and formulates analo uh, analogy. Uh, we see that really transcending the issues posed by Hegel and Heidegger and these sorts of things. But analogia for Trinity, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, a good sign that people are beginning to realize that it's absolutely everything. Uh, if you if you don't know how to handle analogia entis, your Trinity is is going to be it's going to be worthless. Uh, functionally, analogy chastens every statement we make about God. Period. So whenever we attribute something to God, whenever we say God is X, whether that X is an attribute or whatever predication we want, we have to perform the movement of analogy or else we're going to be uttering truth without any understanding. And at least from the Thomas perspective, the reason for this is very simply because of the composition of our predication. Entails, uh, I, I would say that the subject is going to be formally perfected by the light of the predicate. So when I predicate something like red to apple, uh, the redness I intend into the apple as a perfection of that apple and these sorts of things. So when we start doing that, when we start predicating things of God, who isn't perfected by anything exterior to himself, and certainly we wouldn't want to think of our propositions as implying that, uh, whenever we make a predication, we have to append to it a judgment of negation that adjusts for the way of predication that, you know, attends creaturely knowers. And, you know, this, this is, this is just very, very basic, very, very basic to all theology. Right. And certainly to Trinity, it becomes extremely more complex when we get to Trinity. Um, but this is, this is just very, so, very. So the basic. predication is already contained qua God. The predication is already contained in the, in the word God, but in our knowledge, uh, the predication is important because it helps us put the two things together, which are right. united in God. Right. And then we deny that the putting of two things together is something that's happened in God. In isn't God it? himself. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. functioning through that, which is extremely difficult and extremely technical and very difficult to gain understanding of precisely how that goes. So very simple to say, you know, we, Predicated perfection, deny the mode of predication. You know, this is very basic. Everyone knows that. But actually, and yet it helps you read the Bible in a funny way. It's it's technical, and yet it's funny to think that it, at least in a in a kind of basic way, the Bible's already doing this, right? It it seems to say, you know, God changes his mind. God is not like a man that he should change his mind. And there's kind of this affirmation negation structure that's just sort of ordinary in scripture. Again, it doesn't work out the analogia entis in the way that you know human thought has later. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, but that's, it's in a, in a way it's working out something we see going on in scripture. For sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, analogia, fundamental to Trinity, according to Lateran four, this is even confessional. Uh, whenever you attribute a simil similitude, you have to attribute an ever greater similitude. 1215. Uh, you know, Lateran four. It's very, very basic. Yeah. Uh, and so this goes not only for, predicating properties or attributes, but also for predicating persons. When we say God is father, and we say God is the son, and all these sorts of things, we're not surprised when there's, there's, there's chastening that has to be done to our propositions and, and the way of our understanding. Because this is just very basic 
it's exactly what we perform all day long when we're dealing with the attributes. It's not surprising. And, and, and by the way, I, I might add, this is precisely the issue that uh, analytic theology is inequipped to deal with and precisely why I, I well, I don't have very much hope for, for our analytic brothers. But point is, I think that's a good development and uh, I'll have to receive the blows of the analytics at some other time. But yeah, it's very important. Uh, another point of progress I see is that I think we're finally close to actually being rid of the pseudo progress. So we kind of had to go, go back a little bit. And <laughs> Pseudo progress, which at least in my opinion was more of a regress, uh, introduced. It actually is normally viewed as the last great development in Trinitarian theology. 1968, Karl Rahner, his Grundaxia, his his uh, mm. uh, is uh, a, often formulated in English as Rahner's rule, which states that the imminent uh, Trinity is the economic Trinity and vice versa. And this appears to be a good. Uh, you know, kind of rule of thumb, and there's so much debate around what this actually means and how Rahner meant it and how we should adapt in these sorts of things. Well, there's been a lot of wrangling about it ever since, and it is indeed a highly complex issue, but at least in my opinion, the, the way of posing the solution is certainly false, and it cannot support a valid Trinitarianism. So I am hopeful, however, that it's going away. And, and one day we won't have to start all of our books on Trinity by giving our thoughts on Rahner's rule. That would, that would be good. <laughs> um, you know, another development that's, I think, noteworthy for the Protestant world on the subject, um, at, least, at least for Protestants, is I think that there's uh, been something of a freeing of theology. For itself, we all know well the work of John Webster, which emerged during a time period, really after a time period, but somewhat during a time period where theology and theologians were just beginning to awaken after a very long sleep. Uh, they had been induced to, you know, something of a forced slumber for a very long time, especially in the uh, English speaking world. You know, yeah, the, the whole thrust of English speaking theology in the 20th century is designed to functionally muzzle theology and the theologian, and it's very eviscerating. and. Uh, I think I think that theologians are starting to experience more and more, uh, yeah, the the fruit of not being muzzled anymore, and, and there's technical reasons for that. But so uh, I suppose to speak a little bit about my own work, um, as you know, we, we we talk rather a lot about this, but I'm working toward uh, something of a Trinitarian resourcement, uh, especially from the scholastics. So everything on Trinity that's written from about 1200 to 1700 or so and culling through. And the reason why this period is so important is that it's really the point in church history that we see the peak explanatory rigor. So the, the peak systematics, it's like this rough period of 400 years, 500 years or so. It's the highest understanding the church has ever had. And it's there to positive for future generations like today. You read through this stuff and it's truly staggering um, what, what you can find. And the goal that I'm working on is basically to inject that into contemporary Trinitarian theology, not just by repeating it, again, theology is a word in the present tense, but using it to formulate articulate constructive theology and Trinitarian systematics myself. So one volume I'm working on hopes to, hopes to do that as fully and as technically as I can. All right. Um, well, before we, before we close out with our last question, if somebody wants to, you know, uh, look at these issues for themselves or just more helpfully understand maybe the conceptual apparatus of the Trinitarian discourse and Christian history, what are, what are kind of the, what are the texts? What are the basic sort of, you know, if you don't know a whole lot about the Trinity, here's where to start, uh, or divine simplicity, here's where to start. I mean, I would think for Analogia Entis, you mentioned the analogy of being. There's obviously a, a book out there on this that uh, I, th I think you recommend, though it's a difficult book, I want to say. Um, uh, how do you say the author's last name? I always... Uh, well, how I say the author's last name is uh, Eric Privara. Okay. Perhaps I'm wrong, so so maybe somebody can correct me if I am. But Yeah, that's a very, very difficult, that's a very hard book. And is the name just analogy of being, uh, analogia entis maybe? Yeah, okay. analogia entis. Um, so it's very hard. This is a good book. Um, there's, a, there's a book uh, actually that just came out uh, 
I should have written this down, but now, because I, I wasn't going to mention it, but uh, uh, I believe it's by Gonzalez uh, dealing with analogia. And I can, maybe, maybe we can put that in the YouTube comments. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, so, Gonzalez so, and analogia. And when I, I should... remember it. Yeah, he's, uh, he, it's a very, very good book. Very good book. Um, um, and then what about Trinity in general, if somebody wanted to do that? Trinity is a very hard, I mean, you look, you look for books and, uh, you know, obviously you're going to be pulling up plenty of books, but uh, at least in my opinion, most of them are not going to be so good. Uh, especially in English, there's really not a lot in English that's of any technicality. Um, so one volume that is an exception would be Gilles Emery's The Trinitarian Theology of Thomas Aquinas. It's quite good. It's very, very good. And it might be more technical than a lot of people can stand. So if it's too technical to, for you, uh, go down a step. And he's written also just a book called The Trinity, which is more of a layperson level uh, exposition. It's very, very clear, very well done. Um, so those two books probably are the ones in English that I would recommend for starting. Uh, the Trinitarian Theology of Thomas Aquinas, if you're brave, um, it can be a little difficult, but it's, it's well worth your time. And then what about, um, you mentioned the issue of uh, one big recovery has been Thomas epistemology. Um, what's your, if somebody wanted to look at the issue of epistemology and how that, hel or just, just understanding the epistemology that helps us, what would be a great resource for that? Yeah, um, well, Thomas epistemology, yes, is, well, one, one might want to look, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly introductory volume, but it's extremely well done uh, by uh, Friedrich Wilhelmsen called Man's Knowledge of Reality. And I'm not, I think it's a bit difficult to get a hold of, but it's a very good book and uh, it'd be well worth your time. That would, that would give most people pretty much all that they need on this topic. Um, it's, it's very good. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll add to, to, to Ryan's recommendations. One book that is somewhat helpful on this subject as well uh, has been published by the Davenant Institute. Uh, I'll, I'll toot our own horn here. <laughs> the Lord is One, <laughs> Recovering Divine Simplicity or Reclaiming Divine Simplicity. Um, part of the reason I'm recommending that book, though, is because there are two articles. It gets back to earlier things. Some of it just introduces why we're all arguing about the doctrine of God these days. But there are two articles in it by Derek Peterson that are very helpful on putting uh, in putting all of these contemporary debates in sort of the last hundred years of theological uh, reflection. And Derek mm -hmm. Peterson's done just an enormous amount of really good work yeah. that I think is, would be really helpful. Yeah, his, um, I, I yeah. recommend his, his work on that very highly. Uh, he has a paper that uh, perhaps he would make available. Uh, I read it once. I think it might've been his thesis at some point, but it's very, very good. Probably the best summary on 20th century Trinitarian debates Oh, that's republished in the book, actually. Oh, well, fantastic. Uh, yeah, well, it's, well, uh, yeah, so he wrote two well, articles. He wrote an article distinctively for the book, but uh, he was asked by me uh, to uh, include that article as well, actually, because uh, I thought it was uh, the Sacred Monsters, I think is the yeah, uh, yeah, essay. Yeah, it's very yeah. well done. Really, really good. Well, our, our final question then, our trademark question, what should we be talking about that we aren't talking about? And where should the conversation be going? Do you think that it isn't going? Uh, you know, where is it going to a dead end? What's our, what, uh, if, you could, if you could rule the world, uh, what would all the theologians start talking about tomorrow? They, they would be talking about trying to revolt if, that, if I could do that. <laughs> it would be very bad. Um, no, that, yeah, so just, just trying to limit to more the, the conservative-ish Protestant world with that question. Uh, I think I've already indicated, I think the whole analytic philosophy, analytic theology is uh, an experiment of studied futility. Uh, and it is very studied, but it's, it's certainly futility. Um, it might be the rage right now, and I think it's probably going to be the rage for a very long time, and many, many people would be quite upset with me. But I, in my opinion, it completely destroys metaphysics. You cannot do metaphysics with it. You certainly cannot do theology with it. I'm all for conceptual clarity. Obviously, I studied scholastics. 
but in my opinion, taking it in general terms, analytic theology is not the way, not the way of orthodoxy for sure. And, not, and it doesn't really promote understanding either. So disregard me if you, if you think I'm wrong on, on that. Uh, where, where we're not looking as Protestants, but should be looking. I think that I've, I've mentioned the issue of analogia is very important. Um, I think that there are a lot of resources, especially in the Roman Catholic world of, especially during the you know, 20s to 50s or so, the, uh, 1920 to 1950 or so. In France, in Germany, uh, this resourcement that happened for postmodernity and theology in the time of postmodernity is very, very powerful, quite important for uh, Protestant theologians to be steeped in. Um, so to give an example, I think, for instance, Joseph de Finance's book, it's written in French, uh, the title is uh, Being in Action, is extremely important. Uh, these sorts of volumes, which are dealing with navigating concerns of uh, like the Whiteheadian process metaphysics versus mm -hmm. the substance metaphysics and substance metaphysics said pejoratively. Um, I mean, De Finance is, is coming at it from a different angle, but the resources that volumes like that offer for navigating that challenge are, are extremely important. I see Protestants primarily uh, have not resolved that issue, and that's been very much resolved. It's, it's just kind of a mute point. So when you look at something like that, it, it was made popular by, in, at least in the States, by W. Norris Clark's work, Being in Action, his volume. I think it's also called being in action. Huh, that's convenient. I never noticed that before. But the title in French, uh, the one is the title in English of the other. That's, that's rather amusing. But yeah, uh, Norris Clark uh, talking about how, at least for Thomas, uh, you know, all substances fundamentally are substance in relation. They're not closed in themselves and by themselves, but rather they're the center uh, for, for immediate action, you know, first act and these sorts of things. I think that's quite important. Uh, on the topic of the relationship between philosophy and theology, which I think is extremely uh, critical for Protestants to work at, I have yet really to see a good Protestant exposition of that in any sense of, you know, recent years of the last century or so. Uh, I would really like to see the debates that went on especially in France during 1920s, 1930s, there was this very large debate over the relationship between philosophy and theology, between guys like Hillsong, guys like Maritain, stimulated primarily or even earlier by Maurice Blondel, probably the last and greatest exposition of the relationship between philosophy and theology was worked out during that time period. And I don't see that ever interacted with in any sense of the word by Protestants. And it it's, it's truly powerful. Uh, 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 De Lubac has a summary article uh, written, I, I think it was in 1935, mm -hmm. 1936. It's just very summary, but that gives you all of the bibliography that should just be immediately engorged by every Protestant theologian and, and, and spit out uh, again on the page because it's, it's, it's the right way, at least in my opinion. So that would be helpful as well. Right. Yeah, speaking for myself, I, I think that one, one conversation I'd, I'd like to see just on the exegetical and philosophical front, and I try to, I suppose, give an initial gesture toward this conversation in my essay in The, the Lord is One. Um, and, and here I'm, I was drawing a little bit on Julian Marius, because Marius mm -hmm. writes this interesting, um, uh, uh, he writes an interesting history of philosophy, but then he writes this interesting, it's almost its own genre. He writes a biography of philosophy. And I thought that was so interesting. What does he mean by a biography as philosophy? But he's, he's really in, instead trying, instead of trying to sort of repeat uh, sort of what one philosopher said after another philosopher said after another philosopher said, what he's trying to do is just look at philosophy as kind of having its own integrity in life and sort of uh, how did how did the human beings answers to these questions kind of develop organically? Um, and I think it would be really interesting to see people um, be comfortable with the fact that uh, Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David had a certain, if we could put it this way, a certain conceptual understanding of God uh, that was not 
different in an absolute sense, but relatively different conceptually uh, from uh, from Paul and Peter, and then later, you know, the early church fathers and Augustine's conception of God. Again, there's an organic continuity there, but I think it would be really interesting to have somebody trace those uh, sort of tell a plausible story about how the world changes and how our questions change, and therefore how our way of talking about God changes. Uh, and even, 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 um, yeah. I think it would be really yeah. interesting to see texts on just the development, say, of Trinitarian formulations between the New Testament and Nicaea. Some of that work's been done, but very often it's kind of done as though Nicaea is the the end point we know we're getting to, and so we look at it, we look at everything before Nicaea as kind of inevitably going to Nicaea, and that's not entirely wrong. But I'd love to see somebody sort of sit sit with Irenaeus and sit with uh, you know sit with Ignatius. Uh, without imagining Nicaea and sort of say, where are we at at that point? Uh, and why? What are the immediate questions there? Uh, and then, you know, moving on from, you know, sort of sort of moving on from Nicaea. Um, I think that would be just so useful. And I think it would be useful even pastorally. It would be useful, you know, kind of bringing our conversation full circle to coming back and thinking about how we judge our fathers. Uh, in some ways, we judge Ignatius and we judge Irenaeus a particular way because we're looking at them against the backdrop of that they're sitting in. And it's we do the true, same thing it's true. When, when you start doing that sort of work, though, you discover they were saying some very scary things. Yeah. No, and this is, and this is precisely the point, is, is that it's not, there's a, there is a significant continuity in our theology across time, but there's some discontinuity. It's not, it's not we don't need to frame it in terms of contradiction. Is it some not a perfect tradition handed down from day one? <laughs> <laughs> what are we Protestants? Uh, <laughs> for shame. Uh, yeah, uh, no, we are, we, are, we are most delightedly and happily Protestants. And for precisely these kinds of reasons, I, you know, we need to be realistic about this sort of stuff, but also it's not something that needs to offend the faith. It's not something that needs to bother us. It's just the nature of being a discursive human uh, mm -hmm. extended across history. Uh, and so, uh, like you said, it's not infinitely elastic. It's not that there's no end point, perhaps, to theology. Uh, but theology has grown since Adam. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and so, um, and I think that's something that we ought to embrace and be happy about. Apparently, God intended it, even. Um, yeah. But, um, well, that's all from us. For oh, go ahead. I just was saying just the development of doctrine, huh? <laughs> yes, the de the development of doctrine. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, we, we don't have the same uh, uh, to, to, to initiate people in onto the secret. We might have different feelings about that Newman character. Uh, <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> but uh, well, that's all from us today. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in to listen to these two guys talk about the doctrine of God. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, and until we see you next time, we'll see you later.